Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Uh, are you going to tell me how you're going to proceed this morning? Mr. Yes, I was going to do that. I'm Mr. Bacon. This is Ahmed to my left, Mr. Burke to my right. You, sh you should have a number of bundles in front of you. Um, uh, one of those should have um, uh, an opening statement and skeletons. Um, and then you should have three bundles, A, B, and C. I hope one with the pleadings, all with the witness statements, um, a second with the document, bundle B, and then a third, which I think we'll have to have little recourse to, which is bundle C, which is the correspondence. Yeah. The, um, the uh, skeleton argument bundle also has a chronology, which is agreed between the parties, and also the authorities, which will come to towards the end of the day. I hope <coughs> that you'll have. Um, I have four bundles. Yes, you have that. Um, and do you have bundles A, B, and C? Yes, yeah, of course you do. And I, you might have loose um, a state, an opening statement from myself that didn't find its way into the court uh, bundle. I don't know if that's. If no, you have that. I have it in me. You have that. Good. C could I, um, perhaps uh, by way of opening, just uh, uh, take you through? Of that document. In the course of doing so, I'll just give you um, sight of the key documents of the case, which I hope will assist you in and the witnesses. You'll have at least seen those documents. Some um, are broad uh, thinking it is that if we have something like 45 minutes or so in opening each, I don't think the witnesses will take much more than 45 minutes to an hour each, which will give us something like an hour or so of closing. It may be tight. We may um, we may go for beyond four o'clock, but I think we can we can comfortably finish. Uh, today, that's obviously what we would all like um, to do. Um, and then, uh, until uh, lunch break, we'll be finalizing the vote witnesses, you think? Um, possibly. We, 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 we might um, have one witness after lunch and then have, because I don't think the witnesses will be particularly long. I don't think they're going to be done with it. We'll have an hour with it. Oh, it's very Yeah, so okay. I think even if we have. One stood over them. We, we, we should get on to, to the evidence no later, sorry, to this closing, which is no later than a quarter to three, three o'clock. And then it's a matter that would be in your, your Honour's hands, but we'll, I think we can both be done within, you know, with, within an hour of our of closing, particularly with an opening statement. Um, yes. So, in terms of the uh, evidence that you're going to hear, there's only one witness on either side. From my client, he'll be giving uh, evidence in, in person. Um, uh, Mr. Fickery, who gives evidence on the part of the defendant, um, uh, says in his statement he didn't start work at the MAC until the middle of 2012, and therefore uh, that's uh, uh, well over a year after the dispute, which is before your honor, uh, uh, came effectively to an end on the claimant's case. They said that they terminated in 2011. He therefore can't give any personal um, evidence about the states of mind of the parties at the time but of course, a number of the issues are contained in the documents. But there are, we say, some important evidential issues uh, which Mr. Fitchford can't assist the court with uh, at all. Um, there is a, a preliminary uh, issue, or one of the first issues in the case, which is the question of whether or not there is a binding contract at all. And um, it would assist, I think, if we go straight to one of the key documents in the case, which will be in your bundle B, at page 121 and 122. Tab 30. Tab 30. Yeah. Um, you'll see uh, that this is called an Offit Unit Reservation Form. It has the uh, names of the parties, and we say, importantly, it has um, an office unit price towards the right-hand side in the middle of that document of 4544. Okay. Um, I say that that's an important factor in the case because it seems to be the defendant's case that, in fact, my client acted in breach of the reservation agreement because he failed to pay um, instalments based on 
a different price. And if you look, if you could, at um, the skeleton argument, which will be behind tab three of the court bundle, and go, please, to paragraph 26, which is on page 35 of that, that bundle. And you'll see that what um, is being asserted there <coughs> is that um, the waiver uh, forms uh, said that they would credit a sum of 1,279,000. But then it goes on to say that um, in order for the sum at the bottom of that paragraph, in order for the sum of 1,279,890 to be released, the claimant had to pay... 3,264,110 in accordance with the terms of the reservation agreement. I make the very simple point at the outset that nowhere in the reservation agreement at pages 121 and 122 does one see any sight of the figure of 3,200,000. We see one price only. And we see on the right-hand side of that document a proposed payment plan which is simply a reference to a percentage payment and we'll come on to this in a moment but within so many days of a sale date. Um, it's important that another stark statement in the skeleton of the defendant and if you still have the skeleton open. If you go please to page uh, 37 and paragraph 36. Now, your skeleton of argument or on which standard? My, my, Mr. Mr. Burke's skeleton argument. So it will be behind tab uh, three again. Okay. Will be bundle uh, B? No, sorry. We're in the core bundle. I'm terribly sorry. You, okay. Yes, I'm terribly sorry. Bundle A then? Which bundle? Because now I'm confused. I'm you sorry, yes. It should be the bundle. Under A or B or C? No, it's not A, B or C. It's the core, it's the skeleton argument bundle. Okay. <coughs> Tab 3. Tab 3 and paragraph 36 on page 37. Actually, two, two numbers here. Which number? In the middle or on the... Uh, right corner. Sorry, on the right hand corner. <laughs> page 37 of the right hand corner. It's page, page 9 of the document internally, page 37. Okay. Do you have that? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. The, the table of payment. Yes. Okay. Um, well, it, in fact, it's paragraph 36, okay. and you'll see it there stated that the sale date, this is the third line down, the sale date is the date on which the parties signed the reservation agreement. That's what the defendant says. We don't agree with that. We say, if you look, now I'm going to take you back to another bundle. You can put the skeleton argument bundle to one side okay. and go back, if you will, to bundle B. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Bundle B at page two. Tab one? Yes. And you'll see this is a yeah. unit reservation contract for a different... The reservation form. Yeah. yeah. This is a reservation contract for the Executive Bay properties, which my client had contracted to purchase. But he then defaulted on those payments. And the money from Executive Bay was, and this is common ground, was transferred across to the Park Towers project. But you'll see that in this reservation contract, on the right-hand side, the payments are required within so many days of the reservation date. And we say, very simply, that if the date, if the sale date meant the reservation date, it would have said the reservation date. And therefore, the defendant's contention that the reservation date must be the sale date is, must be wrong because they know very well how to say the date of the reservation agreement 
because they say it in a number of other agreements. If I could ask you to go back to the same bundle, number one, um, 120, page 122, which is in tab 30 again. You'll see on the right hand side the words above the table <coughs> are the second, we agree to abide by all terms and conditions and then uh, we are aware that by signing this irrevocable office unit reservation the parties enter into a binding contract um, for the purchase of the above unit. And so you are stopping there. You'll see in Mr. Bourke's skeleton argument, and I won't take you to it now, I will later, and also in Mr. Kukri's witness statement, they stopped there. They were in stops there and we entered into a binding contract. The words they ignore are the ones which follow. And this reservation is subject to. And you'll see on every occasion that they refer to the, the words of this agreement, they, they completely ignore those words. And we say they do so deliberately because they know that in fact it means it's a, a, a contract subject to or conditional on certain things happening. And the first of those things is for the payment of a one dirham deposit. And just looking to the previous page, page 121, if you, if you can look about two-thirds of the way down on the left-hand side, you will see deposit details, receipt number, date 28 October, amount 1 dirham. So effectively they've agreed that that money has been paid. And then back to the, the second page of the document, it says that if that money isn't paid, the contract will be automatically terminated, but of course it was paid. And then it says, me uh, signing the agreement for sale for this office unit within one week of being provided with it and subsequent payments. Now, it's agreed that no agreement for sale was ever sent to my client. I say that the very simple language of that instrument, a simple construction of the English language means the word subsequent means afterwards. And that therefore any payments were to be made after the sending of an agreement for sale. So that all of the disputes which you'll, you'll see can be very easily short-circuited, if you like, by saying, well, actually, uh, Mr. Ward has made quite a lot of payments. He didn't have to make any payments at all because he was never sent an agreement for sale. And therefore, the defendant must be wrong to have terminated the contract. In other saying, you want to say the defendant doesn't comply with the reservation. Exactly. One of their obligations to comply was to send an agreement. Within one week after that. Well, in fact, what it says is that my client has to sign it within one week. Otherwise, certain things would happen. And that gave a right to terminate or to apply a 2% interest rate. But what I say is that whatever whatever the case is, payments were to be triggered by the sending of an agreement for sale. And that on those words... And this agreement came after the cancellation of the first project. That, that's, that's right. Which is Effective, well, in fact, at the same time. The, the, a number of agreements for sale signed on the same day or within a day or so where they released all of the obligations under the old and contract. The payment, the, the payment which uh, made by the uh, claimant on that project has been transferred to this project. Exactly. This is the, the way how the, yes. the one dirham comes. Yes, and, and what, what the 
defendant are trying to say is that you should first deduct the payments that my client made under the old project <coughs> from the four and a half million and that the percentage payments on page 122 should be referable to a price of 3.2 million. And we say, how can that possibly be the case when the reservation contract has a price of four and a half million and percentages of, a, of this purchase price? And it's not even suggested that at the time that my client signed these agreements, there was anything sent to him to suggest that there might be some different price. Indeed, and we'll come on to this, the first time they sent him a statement of account which contained that calculation was in March of 2010. And briefly, I'd say two things about that. One, the court ought to be looking, in looking at what was the agreement, it should be looking at the end of October 2009, And that the suggestion that simply by receiving a statement of account that somehow changes the agreement between the parties, I say is a very, very difficult argument indeed because those documents simply did not exist at the time. So, and, and before me, is only this the, uh, the for reservation form, that's it. There is also... SPA. Yes. Not exist yet. In terms of the purchase of this property, that was the document. Um, uh, and so, and, and it's also common ground that there would be a transfer of the figure of 1,279,000 odd dirhams across to this project. What was not said was how that credit would apply. There is reference in a waiver document to taking the money away from one purchase price, but that could be either by one form, which is the way my learned friend puts it, but I, I don't really see that as a, something which a normal person would, 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 would see as, uh, as the right way to apply the credit, or as we say, simply a credit against the payments which were due under the agreement. So that when he came to make his first payment, or he, when the, if the agreement asked for the first payment, and I just repeat that I say, in fact, the payments never became due, but assuming that they did become due, the 25% that he was required to pay under his first instalment, one would have to say, well, first, we already know that he has 1.279 million in credit. As a first... Uh... Yeah, and so when you look at the first instalment, you should say, well, how much is due? He has a credit of 1279. Does he have to pay any money? And if I can ask you to go right to the end of bundle B, at page 240, which is tab 63. Now, this is the defendant's own document. It's a curious document. It's dated 2014. But if I can ask you to look at the table at the top, you have my client's name, Mr. Mr. Ward, apartment price, 4.544 million, not 3.2 million. Even in 2014, the price is 4.544 million. And the payments required are specifically payments referable to that price. And so what was required on his first instalment payment was for him to pay 1336 1,336,000 dirhams and of course he had more than that in credit and so that um, so that, 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 that's, that, that is the, the first part of our argument is there wasn't a binding contract or the payments were never triggered. And then the next argument of real force, and we said this is an argument which it's almost impossible for the defendants to escape, is that he 
he has paid enough money to get through the first uh, uh, payment that is required of him, he's then required under the reservation agreement to pay a further 35% within a certain number of days of the sale date. And of course I say there was no, no triggers at all, but assuming that there was. So that the maximum that he was required to pay before completion was 55% of 4.544 million dirhams. Now, the second, just assuming for the moment that in fact the 270 days should be taken from the 28th of October. Once again, I say that it shouldn't because there was no payments due, but assuming it should be, that date falls in the middle of July of 2010. And I'm sorry to jump around. If we go back to the document at the end of the bundle, 240, page 240, you'll see that his second payment was also a sum well, and I'm sorry, my writing is still 1363, I think it is. But you'll see the second figure there, 1363. So, but actually he was required by then and before completion to have paid a sum of around about 2.4 million. And of course he only had 1.279 million in credit. So it's not disputed by my client that if and only if payments were due. When it came to July, um, the, my client had not paid enough money. However, and, and that you'll see from a uh, document at page 190 in bundle B, which is behind tab 47. 47. I don't think you need to worry too much of the document. It, 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 it's saying that you're in default. But what then happened was, on page 192, you'll see at the bottom of 192 an email from my client saying, I'm terribly sorry, I've just received this email. Can we talk? And but he was told, well, somebody from our collections department will contact you. And then on page 194, they tell him that his request for an extension of his payments is, um, is accepted. And so whether or not he was in breach at that time, the parties agreed that they would leave that breach alone, provided my client paid some further money. Now, so there is a dispute, Your Honour, as to the amount that he was required. And this email came after the first uh, termination notice, right? Yes, that's correct. And so he was, and, and he contacted them within the time required, and in any event, they agreed that they would um, agree to his payment extension. But what is important is on page 193, there's a discussion there about a conversation. So further to our conversation on the 15th of August, we would like you to inform you that your request for payment extension has been approved by uh, senior management to clear the total outstanding amount. Now, that's important. Damak said that the outstanding amount was 1795 odd. Um, but what's important here is that what the parties were talking about was the monies that were actually outstanding under the reservation agreement. And my client said, well, I, I trusted them that that was the amount that was due. I wasn't making a new agreement. They told me this was what was due, so I said that I would pay. Now, he didn't pay 1.795 million. He paid a little less than that, his last check bounced to 400,000 back. But what is important is 
that by the time we come to March of 2010, which is um, Sorry, it's page two, two, three. By the time we came to March 2010, my client had paid an amount of money, and we'll, we'll talk about the sums of money when we come into the evidence, but he paid an amount of money which amounted to 57.9% of the purchase price. And Mr. Ward says, my reservation agreement on any reading, on any construction of the, of the language of that document required me to pay 55% of the purchase price before completion. I had paid nearly 58% of the money, and yet still, De Mac tried to terminate my contract. And we say that simply cannot conceivably be right. It is perhaps the case, and I say it is consistent with our that a sale and purchase agreement was required before any payments were due. But if one looks at the claimant, sorry, the defendant's own documents, and if I'm going to show you just a few, um, the first is page 172 in this same bundle, which is behind tab 38. <coughs> One seventy-two. One seventy-two. Yes. Thank you. Um, this is saying your next payment is now due in line with the provisions contained in your sale and purchase agreement. Now, of course, there wasn't one, and it seems to be the case that those of the Mac were under the mistaken understanding that there was one, and indeed all of the subsequent communications talk about payments due under a sale and purchase agreement. And there wasn't a sale and purchase agreement. There should have been one. And it's probably the case that those in demand assumed there had been one, which is why they thought they could claim the money. But they were wrong. It is also the case that in all of the, uh, there are quite a number, and I, uh, you'll see them in the evidence, Your Honour, when, when we come to the evidence, there are quite a number of different types of payment schedules referred to in these papers. But at page 88, in this is, sorry, I'm, uh, 23. Payment, uh... Yeah, you'll see an email with some payment terms. And you'll, you'll see as we go look at this document and as we go through the evidence, that there is there, this, these are the standard terms for Park Towers. And this is the project which my, we're talking about today. But the standard terms require the deposit of 15%, 10% payment within 60 days, and another 10% payment within another 90 days. And all of the DAMAC standard terms require payments at the, at the beginning and within either sometimes 30, but otherwise 60 or 90 days. In, and, and you'll see that they call them first installment, second installment. And if I could ask you just to jump back to page 122 in our reservation agreement, which is probably worth your having had, then you'll see on 122, 
there was a zero deposit. There was a one zero deposit, actually, but a zero deposit. And the first installment was zero. And the first payment was um, 120 days later. Why? Because my client had a credit of 1.679. And, and the agreement is referred to second payment, but you refer as a first after the, deduct, the, the yeah. payment which was in the account. Yeah, we said that payment was, 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 should, should, should be applied to our account. And so that what he was actually required to do, and my client certainly understood that he had to do, was, to, was, was that that money would be credited to his account, and that it would be set off against the payments that became due under the agreement. And what is really very important is that what the defendants are trying to say, if you look, um, i just take you to one statement of account for now, which is on page 173, which is at uh, tab uh, 38. It'll be the second page of that tab, 173. Their case is that my client was required to pay a further sum of 813,000 odd dirhams, another payment of 970 odd thousand dirhams. And if you put that money together with the money that my client paid, they were actually requiring him to pay something like 66% of the purchase price under an agreement which says 55% without ever telling him. And we say that if there was any suggestion that the agreement was to be changed in such a fundamental way, the parties had to be very clear that that's what they were doing and to have very clearly agreed it. One of the arguments which the defendant puts is to say, oh, well, look, in September 2010, Mr. Ward agreed to pay 1.7 million dirhams. So he made a new agreement, or he changed the old agreement. And I think I've made the point already that he thought he was paying what was, what was outstanding, what was actually outstanding, and that if he was wrong about that, then there was a mistake and that the parties were mistaken as to what was truly outstanding. But in any event, I say, as a matter of fundamental contractual principle, if you are going to change the critical terms of an agreement, such as price, or such as installment payments due on a purchase of property, then that needs to be exceptionally clear, not just by somebody saying, by the way, this is what is outstanding, and Mr. Moore saying, well, I don't want you to terminate my contract. I've just got back to the country. I've been away. I've been here. I'm just here for a few days. Can we please meet? And they said, well, you owe us 1.7 million. So we'll have some post dated check. That cannot, we say, be, be enough. Not to change something as fundamental as that, to change the purchase price and to suddenly change it from you don't have to pay 55%. In fact, you have to pay nearly 70% purchase price. Just to reinforce the fact that there was no uh, communication to my client, and in fact not even any action movement, or there was no treatment of the money transferred across at the end of October. If I could ask you please to go to page 167, which is behind 35, tab 35. There's two things about this document. On page 167, at the end of um, 
and even in, even in January of 2010, my client is being asked to pay the money that is required to register the property against the purchase price of 4544. So he received a communication in January, no, nothing about 3.2 million, 4544. And then over the page, you'll see towards the bottom of that uh, document, about a, a, by the, I think by the, by the second hole punch, you see the words status change. Status change 24 November. And then at the very bottom, general re remarks, recovery transfer from Executive Bay, AED. So it's not they're talking about a deduction from purchase, but this is an internal document. But they didn't even do the internal accounting until the end of November. So there was nothing at all <coughs> to tell my client. And this is, this, this, is, this is an internal document, but nothing to tell Mr. Ward. Firstly, that this was somehow um, a reduction from the purchase price, but just that there was going to be a, a transfer, even internally. And before I sit down, I just want to make one more point, and that is that some of the arguments that we, we raised, for example, was there a binding contract? Was it necessary for an agreement for sale before you trigger payment? Um, you might, and I would urge you not to, but you might come to a view that the agreement could be read in two ways. You might feel that the words binding contract are important. I say they, yes, they're important, but they're followed by subject to. But there are a number of instances where you may feel that there's a certain uncertainty a vagueness about the agreement. And there's a very important contractual principle I'm sure you're aware of, which is that where that is the case, you should construe the document against the party that puts it forward. I don't think there's going to be any dispute about that as a contractual principle, but and these are DAMAC standard terms. And so that if you have any, any doubts or confusions and say, well, I could read it this way, or I could read it that way, then you should adopt the construction which goes against DAMAC because it is their document, it is their standard term, and if they can't get their document right, it should not be held against my client. And I do finish by saying, just that by way of opening at least, that the suggestion that an agreement which on its clearest face says four and a half million and a payment of 55% of that price, the, the, the idea that that can be terminated when my client has paid 60, 66%, 67% of the purchase price is something which I don't see as an argument that can possibly be tenable without that being shown in the clearest possible way by the documents or by the, the clearest evidence um, of an agreement between the parties, and Mr. Ward has said in the clearest terms, I, be I believed Damak when they told me that this money was outstanding. He says, and come on, I paid an awful lot of money towards this project, a lot of money, and a very large percentage, and I, I accepted what, what they said was outstanding. And it's important to remember that it is also his evidence, and there's no one from Dumac that can contradict this evidence, that when he signed these documents, he was refused copies. And so that when Dumac say, oh, well, he never complained about it, he saw these statements of account, but he never complained about it or said, I want to stick to my reservation agreement. He didn't have the reservation agreement. And so only when he was able to consult his lawyers was he told, well, actually, you've paid money you should never have paid. You should never have paid more than one dirham because they never sent you an agreement for sale. And now, that may be a legal technical argument, but it's actually one has to construe these agreements in accordance with their plain language. And I don't see how one can possibly say 
that the word subsequent means anything other than afterwards and its agreement for sale and subsequent payments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Your Excellency. The defendant's case is one that it's a fairly simple, straightforward matter for this court. If I could take the court to document. Sorry. But uh, would you mind referring to bundle A? Yes, bundle B. Bundle B. Behind. Same bundle. Your yes, uh, that's the chronological document. The so bundle B, tab 31, page 123. I'll start there, Your Excellency. <coughs> the defendant's case is one that this is quite simple, where Mr. Ward, the claimant in this case. Page 123? 123, yes, at the bottom right hand corner, Your Excellency. That's the waiver, release and undertaking letter. Uh, in the top right hand corner, it's got exhibit D5 on there. In the current matter, the, the claimant had uh, sought to purchase seven units in a project known as Executive Bay. Now it's common ground and conceded by the claimant that he defaulted on each of those agreements and that they were validly terminated. Now, according to the document, uh, which I'll refer to as page 123 of this bundle, in the middle there, it's agreed that the uh, contract was terminated by notice on 24 March 2008. If I can then take Your, your Excellency over to page 124 of that document. At the very top of that page, the first paragraph, it says, I, we, hereby acknowledge and accept the termination and agree that Damak number two, which is the uh, uh, executive bay developer, shall credit an amount equal to the paid purchase price one, which in this case is the 1.279890 figure, against the purchase price, number two, which is the $4,544,000 for Park Tower. What I would say there, Your Honour, is that the defendant doesn't dispute that the purchase price for the Park Tower units is the $4 million figure. The issue is to the calculation and accounting as to how the, the payments were to be made. Now, if I go back to that paragraph, so the executive bay developer shall credit an amount equal to the paid purchase price one, so the 1.2 figure, against the purchase price 4.5, provided the claimant fulfills all my obligations as set out within the URC, which is the Red Park Tower Reservation Agreement, including having made full payment of the amount equal to purchase price two, less the purchase price one. And that's where you get to the figure of 3.2 million, Your Excellency. So until he pays that, the credit doesn't vest across from the executive by Danak Star entity across into his account. The defendant's position is that it's a fairly simple, straightforward matter that based on that, after the termination of the executive bay units, seven in total, the parties entered into a binding agreement, at which time on 28 October 2009, the defendant agreed to sell the office unit to the claimant, and the claimant agreed to purchase that. The claimant's position is that it was A, not a binding agreement. 
and B, that it was subject to a sale agreement being issued by the defendant and that until such time there were no payments due whatsoever. The defendant takes a different view of that and says that you must read the agreement in whole. You can't just cherry pick certain pieces of the agreement. And in this regard, the defendant would refer to clause 9 on page 122 of the trial bundle behind tab 30. Then quickly. Yes, Your Excellency. So behind tab 30, page 122. So at the top, as my learned colleague pointed out, we have the, the opening recital, which says that it's a valid and binding contract. Clause 9, if we then read down into the middle of the document, says the agreement of sale will be issued by the developer in due course. There's no time requirement. It can be issued at any time in due course on its standard format. In the meantime, we shall continue to abide by the payment plan and other terms and conditions of this reservation. Clearly, the parties were foreseeing and understood that payments were being made on the sale date, the day that the parties agreed that the property was sold to the, would be sold to the claimant. Standard practice across the Dubai real estate sector, as soon as you enter into a reservation form, payments start being due. If I then re refer down to clause 16, once the detailed agreement of sale is executed, this reservation shall cease to be effective. The defendant's position is that that is clear. Even if no agreement of sale is issued, this reservation form is binding. It contains all the necessary details and information required. If I can take your excellency back to page 121, that's just turning back one page. As the parties names, the purchase price, the area square footage of the unit, the, the unit itself is identified, and most importantly, at the bottom right hand corner, the claimant has signed it, dated it. That's the date he agreed to purchase this unit. Now, the defendant maintains and doesn't alter that the purchase price of the Demac Park Towers unit was the four million figure. However, if I can ask your excellency to turn to tab 38, page 173, which is the statement of account which my learned colleague has uh, referred to earlier. Dated. This is uh, October 5th. It's the, the covering letter is dated 18 March 2010, which is page 172 of the bundle. And over the page, at page 173 of the bundle, and it's got a, a marked handwritten annotation in the top right hand corner D 3. We note there, and I, I just asked the, the court to, to think back to the, the waiver that I read out as to the way the sum that was owed to and retained by Danek staff for the, the claimant's default on those executive bay units. They said in that waiver, we will credit the sum of 1.2 million subject to you complying with your terms, making all the payments for park towers. So at the top, there's a base price, top left hand corner, of the 4,544,000. The amount to be credited was 1.2. So the payments which the claimant actually had to physically make himself were 3.2. So the claimant pays 3.264. That last part 
1.27 comes across from Danak star. That's how it's credited. And then if we go down to the box underneath, here we have the due date. And now that there can be no argument because in there we have within 180 days of sale date and the date to avoid any sort of confusion is now put in there. 26 April 2010 and we tell the claimant you have to pay 816,000. The next line down, within 270 days of the sale date, 25 July 2010, you have to pay 979000 The calculation of the 26 April is exactly 180 days from the date of the reservation form, the sale date. The next line, 270 days, 25 July, exactly 270 days from the reservation date. I would then draw the court's attention to the bottom portion of that statement of account. Item number one says, please check the statement to ensure the accuracy of your balance and please inform us in case of any discrepancy within 14 days. For two years, over two and a half years, nothing, no complaint, no discrepancy was raised by the claimant. In fact, to the contrary, he proceeded because it was his understanding that payments were due to make payments. And in that regard, I would take the court, if I may, to page 193 of the bundle, which is behind tab 50. The second paragraph of that email, we would like to inform you that your request for a payment extension has been approved to clear the out total outstanding amount provided you submit post-dated checks, forced post-dated checks. So there we, the, the, the defendant has agreed to the claimant's request to extend the time for him to make his payments starting from 10 September till 10 December 2010. Four, four post-dated checks of 448,000 each. Then if I can take you over the page your excellency, page 1994. Fifteen days after, we then come back saying, we, like to, we would like to inform you that your request for a payment extension has been approved for four equal instalments from now 28 September 2010 until 28 December 2010, again for an amount of 448, provided you submit your post-dated checks at the earliest. So again, the claimant has not made any complaint, but he's come back to the defendant and said, please give me more time than the 10th of September to start paying off the outstanding amount. And we've agreed, again, you can have an extra 18 days to make that first payment. Then over the page, at page 195, the claimant responds saying, I will be in Dubai on the 10th of October and I will give you the checks as per attached. Now there is no attachment to that document. However, on or about 19 October, the, de the claimant provided two post-dated checks to the defendant. One of those checks, which was dated 31 October, for the sum of 1.3 million, cleared. And that is the only payment which was made by the claimant. His next cheque, which was dated in February 2011, was dishonoured by his bank due to insufficient funds. It was presented on the 28th of March 2011. It was then represented 
on the 5th of April 2011 and decide for insufficient funds again. There is clear breach of contract of that agreement to purchase the unit and the defendant is entitled to terminate. It issued notice on the 22nd of March saying please make the payment within 14 days. The cheque was presented after that notice. It found it was never cured. The defendant's notice of termination became effective and the contract, the reservation agreement for that unit was validly terminated. It's a simple, straightforward case for the defendant. And that closes the uh, defendant's opening argument. Thank you. Yeah. Shall you call your witness? I will indeed, Mr. Ward. Mr. Yusuf? There should be a number of bundles of documents there. If you could ask the clerk to please take up the bundle. Can I hear well? I don't know why. Uh, there is an echo, uh, Nasser. There is an echo. It echo. sounds I'm not hearing you well. Uh, Mr. Jeff, there is a three witness statement. Which one? Now, this morning, uh, I noticed that you filed another witness statement. Yes. So, there will be two witness statements. The first is in uh, trial bundle A at page 98 behind tab 19. That's correct. And the second one this morning you filed it, right? Well, it was, I think it went into the bundle this morning. It was filed last week. Okay. Um, it served last week. So I don't think that Mr. Burke has had it since, since the middle of last week. Uh, we received it on Thursday. No, on Thursday of last week. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Wood, firstly, if you can just um, turn over the pages of um, your first witness statement, which starts at page 98, and if you can go to page 104 and confirm that that is your signature. Yes, this is. And there should then be in your uh, bundle a second statement, two tabs on at page tab 21. 
<coughs> and again, if you can just confirm that it's your statement on page, or your signature on page 117. Yes. And that you've had an opportunity to read those statements um, recently and that you can confirm that they are true to the best of your information. Yes, they are true. Okay. Um, just hold on one minute. I'm not going to ask you any questions at the outset, but if I was to keep them right there, Mr. Morse will ask you some questions. Yes. Please. Uh, will be, there is a second round, or uh, Mr. Jeff, after his uh, cross examine yes. Will be second round for you? Maybe. I think, I think the time it does want to potentially do re examine. Yes, yes I'll re examine. Yes. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Mr. Ward. Um, you've just confirmed for your counsel that A, uh, that is your signature and that the contents of your witness statements are, are true and accurate? Yes. Okay. Can I just ask you, Mr Ward, um, it's not mentioned in here, but uh, your schooling, where were you schooled? Sorry? Where, where did you go to school, Mr Ward? Where did I go to school? School, yes. What was your schooling? Ah, which school? Yeah. Which school? School. Elementary. Elementary, high school, did you go to higher education? What's your background? Do you have any qualifications? I finished uh, computer engineering, bachelor degree. Bachelor degree, so that's a higher computer education. Computer engineering. Computer engineering. And that, that was a, a university degree or? It was a university. University, okay. So you, you, you finished secondary school then, I take it, Mr. Ward? Sorry? You finished your, your secondary schooling? Yes, yep. before and university. You, okay, and you went on to university. You worked at a company called Ijada yes. for quite a period. Yes. And, and what was Ijada, Mr. Ward? It's in computer, system integration. And what was your role there, Mr. Ward? I'm an assistant programmer and project manager, and then I was managing the sales side. Right. So what, what was um, the highest role that you ever achieved there, Mr. Ward? Sorry, I, I can't hear you what. What was your highest position that you achieved? Ah, I was a president. You were president. And you were president between 2005 and two, uh, December 2012, that's correct? Yes. Yes, yes. And was it a big company at Jada? Yeah, it's a big yeah. company. So it wasn't just you working there? There was more than yourself working there? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, big company? You had a team of people working underneath you? I'm president of a company which got a good number of people. I, I definitely was one of them. Yeah. And you would have assistance to uh, help you out in your daily tasks, your diaries, your... Uh... Not really, I was bad in this. So you did all your own correspondence? Yeah, yeah, I was bad in this one. So you had, what you're saying to me is that you had a very large company, but you had no assistance there, is that correct? Sorry, I didn't say that. I said I was managing my schedule myself. I had the system, but I was managing my schedule. Right. Okay. And I noticed that Jada has a, quite a number of tie-ups with large international companies. Is that that was correct at the time? Between 2005, there were agreements with companies such as IBM, Oracle, HP. Yes. You signed those agreements as the president, did you? Sorry. Did you sign those contracts as president? What do you mean as president? Did you sign contracts? Is your role as president? Ah, yes, 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 yes. Of course. Yeah. Did you use lawyers? Sorry? Did you use lawyers? I'm not able to get you. Did, I? Did you use a lawyer? I, we had, of course, we yeah. used a lawyer before I signed an agreement for the company. Right. So you didn't trust those companies? If you used a lawyer, I would suggest that you didn't you didn't trust those companies in entering into them, Mr. Ward. Is that correct? No, I, no. There is a process procedures for Jada which I had to follow, which is the governance of the board in Jada. Right, so you. we follow the governance of the board in Jada, and having to go to have a lawyer look at the contract. 
So you're quite familiar with the, the, the basis of what happens when you sign a contract. So I think that's your question. You've signed a contract before, Mr Ward, both as President of the Charter and both as yourself in your personal nature, yes? Yes. yes. And I understand when I sign a reservation for anything or an intention to sign a contract, I sign after I buy the contract. I understand that very well. I don't sign, when I sign an intention, letter of intent, then immediately we follow it up as a judge and a detailed contract. We don't keep it up to the letter of intent. You've bought quite a few properties over the year, Mr. Mr. Ward, that's correct? So yeah, I have a few speech loading and I have a problem understanding your English, if you don't mind. You have bought a number of properties in your time. In my life, I did. Yes. You've in signed, my life. You've signed a lot of contracts for those properties, haven't you, Mr. Ward? You have signed a lot of contracts to purchase properties. Uh, let me tell you, Michael. What's your uh, good name? I'm asking, you have signed a lot of contracts. I answer. Yes or no, Mr. Ward, my, I'm asking. My age is 60 years old. I have signed a lot of contracts. Property, Thank you, Mr. Ward. Thank property. you. The contracts which you signed for Executive Bay, you defaulted on. That's correct? Well, are we discussing Executive Tuesday? Can I answer it? I've asked the question. I'm, I'm not directing not. the question to Mr. Ward. You have asked the question. Can I answer it my way? I that, that yes or no. Yeah? I'm not here arguing and having a case about Executive Bay. I'm having uh, a case. With all due respect, Mr. Um, Ward, that's the case that you're counseling. Yes, yes, yes. We are going to the history of Ijad and Moses and Mimur Elizabeth, and that's fine. Um, I'm sure we have a good reason for that. You defaulted on those purchases for executive pay, Mr. Ward? Honestly, I don't recall I defaulted. I thought, I thought, but then my lawyer told me, no, we don't want to get into that route. I thought that at that time the map was delayed because they didn't get the permit at that time. However, we agreed, and the major problem, by the way, with the man, there was a change, there was a safe manager, his name, Nabil Ansari, he changed. I trusted that person 100% in everything he did. He told me, sign this, I would sign this. Then, even when I signed that waiver, which you mentioned a while ago, he really was said, Nabil Ansari told me, sign this, and don't worry about it, everything will be fine, I signed it. But the whole point, I have paid, by the way, the transfer to the order of the 1.2 from the executive pay to this project was not just transfer of paper. That was money I paid, the 1.2 which you transferred. So vis-a-vis -vis me, the total money I paid to the mat on the park tower is more than 55%. And really, ethically, and logically, and fairness, I understand I paid more than 55%, which was the contract. And they take the property, and even I try to make a meeting to discuss it with them. They don't have the courtesy to tell me, yes, let's sit and really see what you feel about what we've done. I really, I tell you, I've dealt in business, as you said, I've dealt with companies, but I have never, ever seen a mistreatment from a company like your esteemed company. Never, ever, by the way. This is your answer? No, I'm just answering uh -huh. this. Yes, Mr. Chris, continue. I would take you back then, Mr. Ward. The payment of 1.27, who did you make those to? Who did you pay that amount to? The 1.7 previously? Actually, not 1.27. There were over 2.5 million paid in the executive pay. I've asked you about 1.2, which is the subject yeah, of this can, case. Can I try to answer? And what they've done, when they made the credit, they made the credit from 1.2 to the part tower, to the, to the DFIC, and then they made 1.15 credit to the Lincoln Park and Emirates Road project. So they moved, which I paid about 2.3, 2.4 million to those two projects. Okay. The question and I'm they asking is. Go ahead. Was who did you pay that money to? 1.2 million? To the map. No. Would, was it the map Star Properties LLC? 
This is the problem. I'm not a lawyer, my friend. I deal with the map. Now, I don't check what is the commercial registration of the map. Is it registered under this company or that company? I'm dealing with the map. You make advertisement in the market for the map. Not the map, LLC, the map, DFIC, the map, any of these. I really don't know your legal structure. I absolutely don't have any clue about it. So when I sign with the map, I don't check with which commercial registration I'm signing. I'm not a lawyer, my friend. I don't profess that you are, Mr. Ward. So when you enter in a contract as your president of Ijada, you have no understanding of what you're signing. Is that what you're saying to me? What I'm signing or not? When you sign an agreement with no, no, five No, when I signed the reservation form, it's absolutely I know what I was signing. I was expecting, I was expecting to sign a detailed sales purchase agreement like any property which I bought in Dubai, which I never signed with you. Can I please ask you to turn to page number 123 in trial bundle B? <coughs> One hundred and twenty-three. Okay, you've got that. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. That's your signature at the bottom of the page, is it, Mr. Ward? Yes. Yes. The top of that document is addressed to Demac Star Properties LLC. In the middle, now that's your signature you've confirmed, you acknowledge that you defaulted in the performance of your obligations contained in the contract and accordingly that the contract has been terminated <coughs> from the date of termination, 24 March 2008. That's correct? Look, let me tell you something here. When I signed the document, I signed it with uh, the new sales representative, Mr. Jarrah, right? who was a chain after Nabil Ansar. And really, he told me, look, for you to get the transfer to any other project and keep your money, you have to sign this. And don't worry about it, this doesn't mean anything. Just sign it because we want to transfer the money. We have a process in the back, we have to follow. I trusted what the guy said. I signed it. Honestly, I didn't see, by the way, I didn't get a copy of, of all of this till later when I get, get to the legal case. Even I, I forgot I signed even that. Till I saw that when I have a legal case, I look at, and you know, when you go into a legal uh, uh, case, then you say, How the hell did I, why did I read this? You know, what did it? I look at that. So you're right, I signed it. Thank you. If I read the details in detail, I would never sign it, especially after what starts to happen with the man. I get you to turn over the page, Mr. Ward, at 124. Again, that's your signature? Yes. I slash we hereby acknowledge and accept the termination and agree that Damac number two, which is Damac Star Properties, shall credit an amount equal to the per paid purchase price that's the total of 1.2 which you paid towards Executive Bay. Provided we fulfill all my slash our obligations to set out within the URC, including having made full payment of the amount equal to purchase price two, less purchase price one. So at the time of signing this, Mr. Ward, if I can just surmise, you had terminated Sorry, you had defaulted on the seven executive bay agreements. You agree that they were terminated, and the money, that is 1.2 million, was held by and was validly retained by Danak Star Properties pursuant to that termination. Do you agree with that? Uh, look, uh, sir, I don't distinguish between the mark one, the mark two, the mark three, the WA level one, the mark. They told me you were moving this money from here, from escrow account in like bank, bank, bank to this one. I said very good. They said sign this so we can make the transfer. I signed this to make the transfer. That's all what I've done. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not legal. 
even in my company, uh, sir, when I want to sign a contract, I don't go through details. I have lawyers to go through the details for me. Here, I don't have lawyer. I read it. Nabil said, sign it because when I transfer your money, which is in the executive pay here, I sign it. In a very good faith because I had a very good relation with the Mac at that time. So you ask me a question about Star, the Mac Star, or not the Mac. I really don't know these names. I know one name, the Mac. And your branding is very good in the market. Ask anybody who buys from Mac. Does he distinguish between the Mac Star or not the Mac Star? Nobody knows. It's the Mac at the end of the day. Okay, I'll put the question another way to you, Mr. Ward. Upon termination of your executive bay con contracts, Damak was entitled to retain those sums that you had paid. That's correct? Sorry, I can't again. You paid 1.2 million towards seven agreements. I paid more than that, but what they credit is, no, I'm correcting you, you are wrong. I didn't pay 1.279. I paid more than that in the executive pay. Damak transferred half of that money to this project and another half to another project. This is what I'm trying to correct you. It's not only 1.279 which I paid in the executive pay. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Let me redirect. You were terminated for, on, under the executive pay contracts? Not terminated. We agreed to transfer the money. No, that's, there that's was some, we didn't sign a termination letter. You've, you've, signed, you've signed this letter saying... I signed a transfer of the fund vis-a-vis -vis me. They told me this is the only way to transfer the money is to sign this document. So you're now reneging from your signature being binding on any of No, 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 no. What I signed is what I signed. I made a mistake, I didn't read. I made a mistake, I didn't read. But today what I'm saying is such a termination. I signed this on the basis that my money will be moved to the other person. I'm not denying my signature. Sir. Right. In that case, those agreements were terminated. And what I would say to you, Mr. Ward, is once that's terminated, the money which you had paid under Executive Bay was retained and was entitled to be retained by the Damak entity, Damak Star Properties, for your default. Would you agree with that, Mr. Ward? No, I disagree with that. Can I then ask you, you've said that you, you signed the waivers the Park Tower Reservation in good faith because you believed Damak, you trusted them. You had a good, you did it in good faith, you believed them. You didn't need lawyers, that's correct? Is that what you've just said to me, Mr. Ward? That you have signed the Park Towers Reservation form, you signed the waiver release and undertaking letter because you trusted Damak. Did it in good faith? There's two things actually. I trusted and I made a big mistake by not reading. Well, because your... sometimes when you trust somebody, you tell you, uh, Nabil Ansari will tell me, look, sign to transfer your money. I signed to transfer my money, nothing else. But later we discovered there are much more than only transferring money. And my bottom line here, I paid, I'm not a company, I'm not a developer, I'm not a company. <coughs> This money, my friend, which we're talking about here, represents more than 25% of my life savings. Well, my, excuse me, you ask me to answer. This represents more than 25% of my life savings. And I should be treated as a human here by the company and not, I paid all of this money, 55, and in one night, you take the property and go away, play, play somewhere else. This is very, in my view, maybe I'm wrong, very, very unethical, very unhuman as a matter of fact. Vis a vis me. Can I put it to you, Mr. Ward, that if this money was such a, a big investment of you, as you've just said, 25% of your life savings, that perhaps uh, your failure to read, your failure to uh, use lawyers or have the documents checked is a matter for you? Your failure? No, it's not my failure. Uh, failure always to two sides, my friend. Number one, I made a mistake. I did not push the map to get me the detailed contract. Correct. That's a failure. Right? Absolutely a failure. And unfortunately, I had from March, actually, March, 
2010. Till even end of 2013, a very critical personal situation. Even in the first one year, I was under tremendous depression. Right? For that personal situation, which I cannot discuss in our full delivery, however, and I just got out of it in 2013. So if I was not in that situation, maybe I would have uh, pushed the map to sign a contract. Maybe I would have not signed such a document, right? Maybe, there are a lot of maybes if I was not under that personal situation. And even I was in that personal situation, I went outside the Middle East, I lived in Estonia, this is why you asked me, I lived between Estonia and Dubai. I left Saudi Arabia, I was in Saudi Arabia. It was a tremendous a pressure, personal pressure. I really was under tremendous pressure. And this is an answer to your question. Yes, in the normal circumstances, I would have pushed the map to get the agreement, not the other way out. So from March 2010, you said you were suffering from personal issues? Yes. October 2009, you were fine. Yeah, yeah, was yeah really, you were fine. Yeah, was very so fine. when you went into the happy. agreement, sorry, when you went into the, the reservation agreement and the waiver, you were fine. You knew exactly the what you were doing. Remember the date of it. Oh, let me refresh it. 28 October 2009 yeah, was the If I can take you to page. I trusted the uh, Ansari at that time. Actually. So you trusted Mr. Ansari? Yes. By the way, a lot. I trusted that person a lot. I asked him, I told him, because he, they changed him, by the way. They changed Mr. Ansari. Okay. okay. Mr. Jarrah came, and I called Ansari, I told him, should I sign? He said, sign, so get, you get uh, with it. Can I ask you to please turn to page, um, I have it as page 99 in the, the bundle A, which is your witness statement, Mr. Ward. Tab 19. For your page. Okay. Will be 99 in the right corner. Mm. Yes. 99. So just to, to recount, you've said that you trusted Mr. Ansari, entered into these, the reservation agreement, the waivers in good faith, trusting him. Can I take you to paragraph 8 of your witness statement, Mr. Ward? Paragraph? Paragraph 8. I was very reluctant, but I felt I had no choice and therefore agreed to the consolidation. That doesn't sound very trusting or good faith. No, reluctant, different than trust. I trust the person who is telling me something, but I'm reluctant to do an action. The definition of trust and reluctance are two different things. In my definition of English, if it means the same, I use them in my uh, statement a wrong uh, word for English to describe what I'm trying to say. So you were reluctant, but you still didn't I read the document. I am reluctant when my wife asked me to do something, but I trust I will do it. So you reluctant different than trust. You were reluctant but proceeded to sign the agreement. And I was afraid that I lose the money I paid. This is why I went ahead with this. Actually, when I went ahead with the executive, uh, uh, with the bar tower, even the price was given to me at the map was higher by 20%, 25% from the market price. But I didn't have a choice. I want to just continue and secure the money I paid. You've also purchased eight units, or you had purchased eight units in a development called Lincoln Park, Mr. Ward. Sorry? You had purchased eight units in a development called Lincoln Park. Yes. There is now a Dubai court judgment against you for defaulting on those eight judgments. Not you? defaulting. Ah, now I love what you're opening this subject. I love it. Your Honor, there is a case in Lincoln Park. Tower, which is an Emirates road for eight units. 
for a portfolio of over 5 million dirham. I paid in the first three years in the Lincoln Park Tower over 55% to the mark. And did not, they did not dig even in the floor because they didn't give the permission. And then when they start just the project, they start asking for some payments. I made a case against them myself, not defaulted my friend, just to correct uh, uh, your statement. I did not default. I made a case. I wanted to cancel my, my contract. And I went to the by court and went through a lot of uh, court cases and I, the Dubai court didn't tell me you defaulted, they told me we cannot accept the cancellation which you require, sir. All right. So I appealed and now it is in the Supreme Court. So I wonder how even you can use it publicly in a court and it is in the Supreme Court today. There is no final decision, it is in Dubai Supreme Court. So to correct what you said, sir, I did not default. The MAC defaulted, I made a case against the MAC to cancel the agreement. Dubai court said, no, you can't cancel. I made an appeal. The appeal, they told me, no, you have to continue. It is in the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court will say, you have to continue, I will continue. I did not default, just to correct you, sir. Sorry, and let's do another one. 1.15 from the executive pay was transferred to Lincoln. This is the project I was talking about. And in the court in Dubai, the MAC lawyers never mentioned, never ever mentioned that this credit is debatable. And now in DFIC, they say it's debatable. That's the comment. To redirect, Mr. Ward, the question I asked you was that there is a now a judgment against you in the Dubai civil there is first no instance. judgment against me, sir. There is, I made a case and the courts in Dubai said, no, we don't accept your case. You have to continue with the project. So there is just, and you can check it and I'll ask the uh, honor court to really investigate that. What exactly happened? I made a case, a case against the man. I paid more than 50% even before they start uh, moving the, the sand from the location. So to answer you again, you are wrong by saying a case against you. My case was, was turned down from the court of Dubai. Did I answer your question, sir? I'll move on, Mr. Ward. If I can take you to page and this is very important for you, Anna, that the credit which they moved from executive pay to this, to the other contract in Lingo Park, it was never debated with the man, never, ever, even discussed in the court of the man. Second question, the next one. If I can take you to page 101 of the bundle, paragraph 17 of your witness statement, Mr. Ward. You say in paragraph 17, in the uh, third last line, I was moreover expecting Damak to provide me with an agreement of sale, and therefore I made further payments to Damak towards the unit purchase price. That's correct? You're talking 17, page 101. Page 101, paragraph 17. Third last line, I was moreover expecting Damak to provide me with an agreement of sale and therefore I made further payments to Damak towards the unit's purchase price. Yeah. That's correct? Did you ever, well I put it another way, you didn't say I'm not making payments because you haven't provided me a sale agreement, did you Mr Ward? No, look, there was, I, in my opinion, after really getting into the legal situation, there was unintentional misrepresentation of the man. 
and intention. I must say it's intention. You know? Why? Because they look at the reservation form and they look at the payment plan of the reservation. The amount of the property is 4.5 million. And there is a payment schedule for anybody who buys from the bank, which is 15% on signing and, and, and. and if I look at the transfer of the amount from the other project to here and the other payment which I pay, I overpay. But I don't think the math did it with a bad intention, in my opinion. It was ignorance and they didn't notice it. It was ignorance from my side. I didn't notice it. But then with this stage, I paid more than 55%, more than what I'm supposed to pay before delivery because the balance 45 was supposed to be under delivery. And I'm ready actually now, if the math give me the property, to pay the balance of the 45% and take my property. So I'm negotiating, give me my property. I'll pay the 45%. I pay the, I pay the balance, give me my property. So I'll just reiterate, you've just conceded there, Mr. Ward, that it was your ignorance. Sorry? Your ignorance. You have no, just no, stated it's it my was your ignorance. ignorance. Please watch what I say. Watch what I say very well if you don't mind. Please, listen to what I say. I said it is unintentional misrepresentation of fact by the map. Please, this is exactly what I said. And ignorance from my side not to notice that. This is, I said too, don't take, uh, I'll stop there, you know? You have to take the complete statement, please. So, did you get my answer, sir? I did. Can I take you then, Mr. Ward, into the chronological bundle of documents? Page 172. which is the letter dated 18 March 2010. And there is an attachment to that letter, which is a statement of account. Yeah, 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 you accept that that's a statement of account that was issued to you in respect of the Park Towers unit? Yes or no? So you can see it, yeah. Yes? Okay. Can I take you then to the bottom of the page, point number one? And I'll read that for you, Mr Ward. Please check the statement to ensure the accuracy of your balance and please inform us in case of any discrepancy within 14 days. Did you ever contact the map and raise a discrepancy? No, because I tell you something. I think uh, this is not only me, this is general uh, problem with people, between people and companies who provide the development. You write every letter very carefully legally as an end user, as an individual who buys a house and a house. I don't need all details and intervals. So I never went back, correct? Never did that. But I didn't see anything on it. I see the government. I saw it in a high level and I'm okay because I be paying and my dear friend, I paid already what I'm supposed to pay for that property. And on the completion, I need to pay the balance, I'm ready to pay the balance, this is what I'm saying. Today I, and this is why we are in the steam great court here, to look at that because I want to be fair. I want fairness, I don't want anything else. The Quran is here, right? I swear to God, on the Quran, I want to be treated fairly. This money which was transferred from the individual pay, this is not stolen money. My friend, I worked day and night to get that money and I paid it, which was a transfer. I used to work 14 or 15 hours a day to get that money. So today, 
Bank of Mexico is just 2.5 million. Bye bye. Thank you very much for time being with you. This is unfair. unfair. I cannot imagine this is happening. I really cannot imagine this. Sorry, I took some of your time. No? no I, would, I would say exactly that, Mr. Ward, that that is why you thought, and it was your understanding that payments were made, and why you agreed and you requested an extension to your payment plan. And I tell you, at that time, before I get the lawyer, there is a, a two stages. Before I get KBH as my lawyer and after. Before, I really trusted what you're telling me I need to pay and all of this. And I made and we get into the problem. Then when I look at the, really, the purchase price of the 4.5 and the transfer and what I paid, my lawyer told me, look at this, you paid more than what you're supposed to. They don't have a case even to, to ask you for more money. So I discovered I paid more money, fine. La hawla wa la quwa, what can I do? Fine. I accept that. But not only I accept that, and I lose the property. And this is the, what really I cannot comprehend with my uh, little ability to think. Can I ask you to go to pay paragraph 25 of your witness statement, page 102, Mr. Ward? And what I would ask you is, throughout 2010, 2011, you were still working at Ajada? Yes. Yes. Your email address was and always has been at Ajada? Yes. Why ward at ajada.com? Yes. Yeah. So then in paragraph 25 of your witness statement, Mr. Ward, you say, I spoke to Mr. Ansari and agreed a payment plan with him to cover what I understood, now this is critical, at the time. Your understanding at the time was you had a binding agreement and you were required to make well, payments. My, uh, my understanding at that time, I had a binding reservation, not agreement. They didn't have an agreement yet, right? And there was a payment plan, which I did, I'm gonna proceed with, yes. And I was promised so many times that the SPA, sales purchase agreement, will be sent to me the UK. Never got the sales purchase agreement. Till today, I don't have the sales purchase agreement. And normally, in any business, my business, your business, when I do uh, letter of intent or intention to buy or reservation, after a period of time, could be one week, two weeks, three weeks, one month, two months, you sign the detailed purchase agreement. Can this you take me anywhere in any the documents? It is a normal conduct in any business. Can you take me to anywhere in your documents where you request a sale and purchase to the agreement? A sale and purchase. Remember, ask, call, uh, I'm sorry, now, now give me a call. I have a number. Tell him, uh, please, how many times Yusuf asked you for the agreement and you said it's with CRM, they will send it to you. With, with the CRM, they will send it to you. CRM will send it to you, they never send it to you. Call, please call, I'm sorry, now. I can give you a So, if I can reiterate, Mr. Ward, at paragraph 25 of your witness statement, you agreed a payment plan to cover what you understood at the time to be outstanding of your purchase. I put it no further that your understanding was that you, you had outstanding payments that you had to cover. Yeah. It's outstanding payment. Yes, I think Correct. you used the right uh, word here, which I like, and thank you very much. Uh, we were talking about outstanding payments. There is a purchase price of 4.5, there is transfer of the 1.279, and they made some payments. So there is an outstanding out of that based on the payment plan. And after really I go to my lawyer and thank you very much uh, really uh, for uh, drawing my attention to that, DK, because today I found out I paid you more than what I should even. By the, by the time you terminated, by the time you took my property, by the time all of that, you, I paid you more than what you should have got. And on top of that, I paid the 3.5% to DFIC registration, which I, we have a copy of it. And by the way, I just want to tell you something else. After your termination, your CRM again sent me to pay for the registration. Second time. After even you terminate, just uh, comment, just for. Uh, so, Mr. Ward, then, you've just said that you paid the 
the fees to the DIFC for the, the, the registration of the property, is that correct? Sorry? You paid the fees. Yes, I did. This. You did that. And the, the, sorry, the property is registered with the registry? No, no, this is why. I paid the 3.5 because the following I need to pay, they gave me an account number, I made the transfer to that. And then they terminated the, the property. I don't know what they have done, and we would like to do to know what they have done with the property. Do I, they own it, are they renting it, are they selling it? I don't know what they've done with it. But the it's, registration doesn't complete. The registration, I paid the registration, fee is not complete. I went to the FIC before I made the case and told them, I paid this, they said, no, you said this with the map, not with us. They didn't want to interfere with that. So I would like really to know and ask, you know, uh, what have they, have they done with my property? This is, BB, this is my property. So yes, if I can take you to document 171 in the chronological bundle. Now that appears to be sent by somebody uh, from Ijada Systems, which would appear to be on your behalf attaching the 3.5% of the property value. Now the document's not clear, but I yes, think for yes. all intents and purposes, we can say that that's your payment to the DIFC for registration of the, the property. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. I put it to you, Mr. Ward, that you wouldn't make such payment unless you thought you had a binding agreement to purchase the property. I'm not, de I'm not debating that I thought I had a binding reservation. I'm not debating that at all, at all, at all. I, I swear the Quran, I know it was a binding agreement, but I was expecting the detail to be paid. I agreed on a certain payment plan, but the unintentional, the Mac misrepresented how much I need to pay. I discovered what I need to pay is I overpaid already. All what I'm asking now, there was a misrepresentation, unintentional by the way, don't take it personal, absolutely unintentional. There was, I didn't see all of that, just now, settle, and either you give me my money and as I requested with the interest, or let me pay the banks and take my property. I don't need anything more. I don't need anything from you, I don't need anything from me. That's all I'm saying. So, to really answer you again, uh, sir, yes, I always thought I have a binding agreement. Yes, I wanted to continue all of that, and this is where we are. And this is where we are sitting, in the court to see how we resolve the issue. But the res resolution of the issue is not that even if you tell me the fault is out of five million or 200,000, example, example. Eh? You just cannot out of the blue and tell me I'll take the property, go on somewhere else. This is just, I cannot comprehend that. I cannot comprehend it. And I asked to sit and discuss it with you. How do we resolve it even before the lawyer? Then nobody wanted to do that. Then I get the lawyer, and then I understood even I overpaid after I got my lawyer. Very luckily, I got my lawyer. Well, if I can then move on, Mr. Ward, we'll, we'll deal with your payments, if I may. If I can refer to page 102 of your witness statement. Ah, uh, sorry, 102 of the bundle. My apologies. Bundle yes, I think we've all got it. No, I got the statement. Yes, thank you. <coughs> <coughs> this is the same one we had a look before, I just right? Correct. Yeah. Now this is what I'm going to ask you again, Mr. Ward. In paragraph 26, you, you say that as at 31 October 2010, you had paid 2,626,335 dirhams towards the Park Towers purchase. Yes. I put it to you, Mr. Ward, that you had actually paid 
to Damak Star Properties, a different, separate legal entity, which you had entered into for the executive pay. They were the payments that you made towards that project. Who is your question? You provided Damak Park Towers a cheque dated 31 October 2010. Is that correct? So could you just answer for the transcript, please? Sorry? Could you answer for the transcript? Yes. Thank you. It's correct for both. Yeah. I paid the 2.6 yeah. for both. Now, you tell me about legal entity. I really don't know legal entity. Ask about any customer of the map which legal entity you're signing with. Nobody, normal customer wouldn't know is it Star the map, is it uh, uh, Sunshine the map, is it Moon the map? It's the map. Well, i put it another way, Mr. Ward. What did you, you did you pay 1.2 million to purchase units in executive pay? Excuse me, sir. Maybe I'm repeating myself. Sir. I paid 1.279 in the executive pay, which was agreed to transfer to the part tower. I paid 1.150 to the executive pay, which was agreed to move to the Lincoln Park tower. So we moved, we, I agree with the map, I don't know what you call it, in legal structure. I agree with the map, they moved 2.5 million, more or less, to two projects. One of them is the, is the uh, Lincoln Park, and one is the park tower. So this is my answer. I'm repeating, I repeated the same thing maybe 10 times. So I, I don't know the legal structure. Till now, you know, you asked me the question three, four times. I swear to God, I don't remember the Damak legal structure. I don't know which one you're talking about. Okay. You know it, it's your company. I was asking Mr. Ward, I wasn't asking about the company structure. What I said was, you paid 1.2 million towards purchasing executive bay units, correct? No, no, no. I'm asking about 1.2, which is the subject no, of this say paper. more than that. You asked me a question, I'm correcting you. I paid over 2.3 million to the executive pay. Right. But they gave a credit to this project of 1.279. This is to be accurate. Out of that money. The rest of the money was credited to the Lincoln Park and the Emirates Road. And upon the executive pay agreements being terminated, you forfeited all right. It was, I'm not discussing executive pay project because the executive pay project was settled between me and the map to transfer the money of that property to these two projects. Correct. Under the waiver agreement which you signed, Mr. Ward. That's correct, isn't it? You say that, fine. Correct. Right. Thank you. The waiver, I put it to you, Mr. Ward, which you just said settled the matter for executive pay provides that the amount will be credited. Yeah, but they didn't default. You're telling me default. Even with the waiver, even if I take your point, my, my, my friend, right? And if I default, you would take it, even if I take that point. I paid over 55%. I did not default. So you cannot take the money which is done. I did not default. Absolutely did not default. Until now, I tell you, give me the property, I'll pay you the 45%. And I, it's not 45, actually now it's 42 because I paid 58%, not 55. So, even with the waiver, what you're trying to say that the waiver, I can't talk your money of the credit, you don't have the right by any standard, in any court, by any legally or ethical or uh, humanitarian, you cannot take the money because it is not default. I paid more than what you, what I owe you. I would then refer you to uh, paragraph 27 of your witness statement, Mr. Ward, at page 112 of the bundle. Sorry, paragraph 26, where you refer to a payment made on 31 October 2010. You also provided a second check, Mr. Ward, didn't you? Dated uh, 28 February 2011.
So you provided a check dated 31 October 2007, 2010, which you referred to in your statement. And then you provided a second check dated 28 February 2011 for 448,000. Did you, Mr. Ward? You said uh, what is written in the statement is correct. And by the way, the same thing you said in your uh, speech, you exactly said the same thing and you refer to the same point of the check and the portrait check. So it's really that. Because you referred that before even to more details about it. And what happened with check and so on. And the extension and so on, we listen very well to what you said earlier. So did you provide a check or not, Mr. Ward? I did. You did, thank you. That mm -hmm. amount of that second check was four hundred and forty eight eight hundred. Was bounced, yes. Yes, it did. <laughs> was bounced twice, by Twice. Then. Yes. never corrected, Mr. Ward, you never pro provided a second check? Sorry? Any further, you never provided any further payments after that check had bounced? No, I was trying actually to really have a meeting with the top executive, but there were some changes, I think Peter by that time left the CEO of the company, and I wanted really to have a full discussion because of this, and the Lincoln Park, because the Lincoln Park didn't start by that time. So, never, and then, the accelerated movement moved to the But you can see that that check bounced. No, that I know. Yes. yes. And you received the notice. But by the way, when, it bounced, when the check bounced, if you look at the total amount paid, even without that check, I'm paid more, uh, almost 54%, or 50, 55. Uh, sorry, 58 without that check. Without either that check, I paid 50 so far. You collected no, no, no. for you did no, no, no. for me you calculate that, Mr. Ward? Sorry? How do you calculate that percentage? I, I did. How did you calculate that? I calculate what I paid over 4.5 million. Uh, how did you get to that figure of 50 percent? Okay. can do that right, right now. Uh, it's 2.6.
computer, the device, and uh, the amount I paid between the, what I paid in cash and what was transferred. So, sorry, it. just to quote, who did you pay to what? What did I pay to who? Uh, I'm trying to answer to the money. You asked me a question. Yes, How did I reach to the 57 to the 8 percent? Correct. Trying to answer. Trying to answer to the 2.626, which is total of what I paid in cash, the check which was cash, plus what was transferred on the executive pay of the 1.279, it totaled to 2.626. I divide this over the purchase price of the 4.5 uh, something, it comes to 57 point something percent. This is how I reach that percentage. And that is more than what I should pay by delivery, because the balance I should pay on delivery. So I did not default from that perspective. So can I just clarify, Mr. Ward, just to, to make sure I understand your, your calculations. The 1.279890 was paid under the executive bay contracts, and what you say is that that's credited across. That's credit. It's my money. They moved that across to this project. And they move another 1.1 to the other project by friend. I am paying the same thing. What do you want me all to tell you? This is not my money. It's my money. They move my money from one project to the other project. You want me to tell you it's not my money? It's not correct. It's my money, my friend. I paid in cash. Paid, <laughs> you paid the cash. You didn't give, it, give me that credit for my black eyes, my friend. All right? You gave it to me because it's my money. And it was an agreed to be moved. But it was paid the 1.2, and I want to be very clear on this, Mr. Reward, to make sure I understand that your position is, and that I'm clear, that 1.2 was paid under the executive bay contracts, and that you say it would be moved across to Park Tower. Is Not that moved. Good? It was moved. It was in the statement of account. Well, well, that's, that's Credited. Credited to my statement of account. Maybe I'm not... Okay. It's credited. The total... In, in the statement, in your statement, between the credit and the cash is 2.626335, which I pay between the two projects. And by the way, the other project which you moved to Lincoln, which you said you claim that there is a, a case against me there with the other way around, nobody in the MAC said that the 1.150 is not a money transfer there. You, it was not mentioned either. Because you're trying to take a route here but subhanAllah, it came the other way around. So then, can I just go back, Mr. Wood? The 1.2, <coughs> that's a credit that was to be made by, and I'll, I'll use the entity, Damat Star Properties, LLC, towards your park towers. So the payments that you made directly to the park towers company for the purchase of the unit was 1.365445. You are wrong. The direct money I paid to the map. No, don't, don't tell me the Mac Star and the Mac XYZ. Please, for God's sake. Please, I am old. I'm like uh, your father, my friend here. Don't get me into those routes. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a legal guy. I paid to the Mac 2.626 dirham. All right? Million dirham. They move some from here to there. I don't know. They move from the Mac Stars, the Mac uh, Lake, Silver Lake. I don't know. They, it is the Mac vis a vis me, my friend. Don't do that to me. You're asking me the same question 50 ways. Uh, sorry, why? <laughs> My apology, really, really, it's getting bad. These questions, you're asking the same question again and again. Okay, Mr. I'll move on. If I can ask you to turn to page 223 of Notice of termination dated 22 March 2011. <laughs> Did you ever receive this document, Mr. Ward? No. no? Well, previously you've just confirmed for the record that your email address was yward at data.com. That's correct? You were still working there at the time? My friend, I was working there and I was under just out of this world situation, which I really don't want to get into. And this I did not see, and I'm under the oath here. 
I did not get. By the way, even in the mail, even those documents should be sent by registered mail normally, not mail, not email. Well, I was just going to interrupt on that point because when I was going to say you had an email address, but the document itself talks about registered post. Yeah, I saw that. I'm very good. And if I may, Your Excellency, I'll take you over to 224 over the page. You have a question, Mr. Chris? I'm confirming that this notice of termination was received by the claimant. And it was received. And I believe he answered your question. Thank you. The next question. If I can then take you to page 227 of Bundle B, Mr. Ward. So here we've got an email from Damak, Mr. El Ansari. Uh, Beta Ward, can I ask who that is, Mr. Mr. Ward? Sorry? Who, who is Beta, B-A-D-R Ward? My son. Your son, okay. And attached to that email, if I can take you over the page, is page 228, is a statement of account. Is that correct? There is no discrepancy or issue raised at that time, was there, Mr. Ward? You never came back to Damak, or your son never came back? Okay. Uh, dear sir, let me just try to answer you here. There is no debate at this stage of our table of account. There is no debate that there is a bound ship of 448. No debate with that. I'm confirming all of that. What I'm confirming here, what I'm saying, because you know, there are a lot in business, in property, in real estate, there are things happen, some good, some bad, some ugly. However, we are at a situation where I'm confirming and I'm swearing, I paid you more than what you should before delivery. I paid you 57%. I shouldn't pay you 55%. So today, what I'm saying, you're going into detail which doesn't affect the fact we end. The fact we end, I paid you 57, I was supposed to pay you 55. <coughs> there was unintentional misrepresentation of facts by the man. There was ignorance from me. We got to where we are. I overpaid to what I was supposed to. You took my the property, my property, while I overpaid. I need a correction in the situation. This is what I said. So, to confirm to you, yes, table of account is there. Okay. I'm not debating what you owe me and what I owe you. I'm not debating that. Okay. No debate on that whatsoever. So, I then take that notice of termination, which I just referred to earlier, was dated 22 March 2011. Between that time, and this is the documents in this case, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, there is no correspondence from you to DMAC in any way disputing or contending that the right of termination or that the payments were due until some two and a half years later. No, that's correct. Not correct. I called I call them because I want to finish all the transaction, I think in 2012. I called them. And then, by the way, I went to Rera, by the way. I went to Rera and addressed. A letter. I think it's in the file somewhere. Can we refer to it? I think, uh, yes, it's I think in the green page, one. Page 234. Sorry? B234. Right. If you go to page 334. Tab 61. Arabic document, right? It's a claim. Eh, eh. Yeah. Because of what happened with... In, in English, please. Ah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Because of what happened in the past, I really wanted to cover. I went to November 3, 2011, sent to Rea. What happened with me in the board project? Because I went to fair treatment. And I followed up with their office, actually, to see, unfortunately, even I was not advised to do anything, nobody uh, took care of that. And I was still under the 
very bad person situation, I didn't do anything. But then I came, tried to do something with the Mac, the Mac management changed, the decision maker changed. Even Nabil Ansari left uh, the Mac at that time, so I said, let me go, I'm fine. A law firm to take care of that, and I went to the, uh, the lawyer, which is costing me a lot of money. Not only um, you took my property, you're costing me more money even to pay legal fees, unfortunately. So that was some two and a half years after that notice of termination, Mr. Yes. Ward. By the way, uh, what I passed through, my friend, uh, get mounted to go down. Okay, so two and a half years is nothing. Just to let you know. Excellency, that uh, concludes the defendant's cross-examination of Mr. Thank Ward. You. I have one question for you, Mr. Ward. Did you know the completion date of this project? Completion date? Of this project? Not. The, by the time I made the, the payment, yeah, they were, at the beginning they were talking about completion date of uh, 2011, I mean, at the beginning. Even I have in the, my books the, the, the brochure, you don't mind uh, it's okay. sure the Le later on we'll come to the council. Yeah, but, uh, they, it was 11, and they were delaying it. I was okay with the delay. But but nothing is written in the uh, agree reservation agreement. No, it's not written. Verbal. It's verbal. You know. Verbal 2011. It was. And we expect that the, the final payment, which is a 45 percent. In 11. Will be in 2011. 11. Than a completion date of that project. Yes. Budget. So I was expecting, and I was managing and working in, in that case. Right? I don't think I didn't take much. I didn't want to take much. So the 45, 42 percent, 43 percent, I will pay toward 2000, end of 2011. But they didn't finish and they took the profit. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Jeff, you have a, a few questions, please. Yes. Um, you, you said um, a, a few times that you signed a reservation agreement and you're expecting to receive a detailed uh, sales contract. Um, can you look at bundle B, page 36, please? This is um, in relation to Executive Bank. It's after you've signed your reservation agreements. Um, and what is this? What is this letter doing, as far as you understand? What does the letter tell you, tell you that it's providing? If we read the letter, it says that you've they forwarded you a sale and purchase agreement. So did you receive sale and purchase agreements in relation to executive bank? Yeah, but this is the executive bank. Yeah. Executive so is that, consistent, <coughs> is that consistent with what you would have expected to happen? Exactly. Yeah, this is the normal business as usual. Exactly. Yeah. And so you said in your evidence that you considered yourself to assign a binding reservation, but not a binding agreement to purchase the property. And by the way, this is that, for me, this is a very well-known practice in the East Cape in Dubai. In Dubai, you make a reservation, you either make down payment or whatever the agreement is, and then you expect to sign a detailed sales purchase agreement with the detailed payment and the condition, obligation, liability, everything on the agreement. So I was expecting definitely that, similar to the executive pay before. And you say that you asked many times for the sale of purchase agreement and it was never sent to you. I'm not sure the extent to which it's um, it will become relevant, but can I ask you to go to page 46? You said in your evidence, and you are asking, you said there's a document in the bundle. Mm -hmm. um, page 46, you said one of the things in relation to Executive Bay, why, why you didn't think you were actually in default, was that they never had a permit for Executive Bay. Can you, can you sit, tell us what page 46 tells you? So there's this time. In B still, yeah. 
Sorry? Yeah, in the executive pay in 46. I remember, this is why I tried to answer in the beginning. I remember, but they told me, no, it's wrong, it's, uh, it's really reported. I don't remember I reported the executive pay. Even when I made the transfer, and if you look at page 46, there was no bill permit, permission yet for the map in the form. I remember, I swear to God, that at that time, we moved the money to there. They did not start the project yet. Absolutely did not, in the executive pay. But I don't want to go into executive pay discussion, because this is not uh, what uh, the court is looking at. They're looking at this, but in the executive pay, when I moved, it's not a default, but I don't want to get into, into that argument and discussion. They did not start the project, and please check, when I moved the money, did they start the project at that time? Did they get a, a permit to start the project? I would appreciate somebody to look at that, because I don't think they started or they got a permission from the government to start the executive bill project. Um, in the same uh, bundle, please, could you go to uh, page 172, which you'll find at tab 38. And the beginning of that letter says, your next payment is due in line with the provisions of your sale and purchase agreement. Was there a sale and purchase agreement in relation to um, Park Towers? Was there a sale and purchase agreement? Yeah, but there is no suspicious again. And over the page, it was um, put to you that this in some way <coughs> showed you, and you were taken, and you may remember, you were taken to the note at the bottom of the page, number one, please check the accuracy of this statement. You remember being asked a question about that when you were giving evidence? Remember, you were taken to number one and said you were told, please check the accuracy. And yes. he said, Mr. Mr. Porter, you never went back and challenged anything. Can I ask you this? Did you understand from this document that in some way the purchase price for your unit had been changed? My purchase price always is a good thing. Always, even with my family when they asked. I said I bought for 4.5 million, 2,800 something square foot. So it comes to... 1,600 per square foot, which was at that time 30% higher than the market, but I accepted. I have to move. So vis-a-vis -vis me, always the purchase price is the 4.5, nothing less. Absolutely. And did you understand from this document that in fact you were being asked to pay 67% of the purchase price before completion rather than 55% of the purchase I didn't price. calculate it that way. I didn't look at it that way. Even. Sorry. And one answer. more question. I really, at that time, I didn't see it that way. That's it. And then when you look at the payment schedule, the due date schedule, the first payment due there from you is 816 odd thousand, correct? How much did you think you'd already paid by then? Look, let me tell you what happened at that time. At that time, when we moved, when we moved that money from the executive bank, the price is 4.5 million, okay? So I expected when they move, we'll cover payments one and two, phase one and two over there. So now I need to pay a three, which is uh, 1.2 plus another 400. Later, I deported the 400, and I tried to settle it with the, with the map. It didn't work. I came to you, and I discovered I paid more than what I supposed to by 2% even. So this is the situation. Vis-a-vis -vis me, the 1.2 is actual money I paid. They transfer it from ESCO Y to ESCO account B. I, I don't know this detail. You know, it's a pity to be in this situation and paying what I paid and with a good developer like the map, it's a pity to be in this situation. I feel really very bad about what's going on. For unnecessarily, absolutely unnecessary. Oh, thank I you, Mr. Bob. paid my obligation and they took my property. Again, I don't believe that. I just can't believe it. That's all.
Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. The, now, Mr. Uh, Jeff, you want to continue or take break until I will hear second witness um, after lunch break? And may I invite both parties? If there is a willing for settlement, because I heard Mr. Yusuf that there is a trying to settle, but there is a no. I don't know about the, the situation. Your Honor, from our part, there always has been. However, there's been no, nothing said by the defendants in this matter. So obviously, you've heard the evidence. It is now a matter for them to deal with in their court. Yes, Mr. Uh, Christ. You can start. Thank you. I don't have any instructions on that, and I would have to um, take instructions to see whether there was any. <laughs> That's the first time that I'm Do you think of it. it's worth, uh, during the lunch break, take an instruction from your, uh, from your uh, client and come back? I would, um, never, I, I would never rule out trying to reach an amicable settlement, and I would take every opportunity to do that, thank you. And, uh, well, I, I, would, I, I would take the opportunity to seek instructions and, and revert back to the court positively or negatively. In my I think one thing that may be important is one thing that we can try to find out is what has actually happened to this case. And it still, never, still exists or, or no, sort of different? And, and the property is registered somewhere. But we, I think he's going back to his client. I will ask him. I, I'm very much in your hands. I'm easy to, I'm, of course, I'm ready to carry on with the evidence that maybe it is an appropriate time. But we, we stop now and have a take, take an hour now rather than Unless an hour. Uh, you will take half an hour for a cross exam, and I'm happy to proceed for the second witness. I think, it will, I think it will take a little longer than half an hour. I don't want to pin myself to half an hour, so if, 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 if it's a half an hour maximum, I'd rather would. Uh, okay, then stop let's come back after the lunch break at uh, 2 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, could we come back at one? Could we just have an hour now? Otherwise, I'd rather take okay, that. Fine, fine, fine. Uh, only because I don't want to lose an hour and a half, if that fine, would be fine. possible. No problem. Because okay. we may not reach a second meeting, and therefore we've lost an hour. That's okay. Yeah. I'm happy to. And it, and yes, and it, I mean, it may be that once we finish the evidence, we have a five or ten minute, five, five or seven minutes, otherwise it's a very long afternoon. But if we could take an hour now, that would be very, very, okay. very grateful. Then we'll come back at one thirty. Many thanks. Well, Thank you. And still, I encourage you, if you willing to settle, I believe this is the proper time to settle. Thank you.